All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the U.S. Heartland China Association's event tonight. My name is Jason Conley. I am a program associate at the U.S. Heartland China Association, and we are very excited for our most recent author event on the book called You're Hired, a guide for foreign-born people seeking jobs. Um, we are very lucky tonight to have the book's author, Betsy Cohen. Betsy is the executive director of the St. Louis Mosaic Project, as well as our own board member and the president and CEO of Genective, uh, Linda Jing. Um, before I introduce them, I'm going to just go through a few quick housekeeping things for tonight's webinar. Um, first of all, we wanna thank our sponsors, the Ford Foundation, as well as the Henry Lewis Foundation, without which tonight's event would not be possible. Um, at any time during tonight's webinar, if you would like to ask a question to our uh, wonderful panelists, please feel free to do so in the bottom of your screen. If you are deaf or hard of hearing, we also have live transcripts enabled that you can turn on in the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have 60 seconds after the webinar, uh, please feel free to fill out our survey. So um, back to our wonderful panelists for tonight. Uh, we're very excited to have the author of Your Hired. Uh, Betsy Cohen is the executive director of the St. Louis Mosaic Project, a program of the uh, World Trade Center in St. Louis within the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership. Uh, her goal is to attract and retain international people to St. Louis for their skills and cultures to add to their population and diversity. Um, this work is done through working with the youth and lots of outreach in the state. Um, Betsy in her, in her career has worked with hundreds of international people in their job searches and career advancement. She's made an extensive corporate career in marketing at an international consumer goods company and has uh, many more things that um, I, I, I won't mention tonight uh, only due to the fact that her uh, biography is so impressive. Um, we're also very honored to have USHCA's board member, Linda Jing. Um, Linda first came to the United States in 2002 where she got her MBA at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Upon graduation, she joined the corporate strategy group of GM uh, in 2006, she went on to Missouri to supervise UAW production teams um, along the truck assembly line. Um, later, she returned to agriculture when Monsanto, now part of Bayer Crop Science, was seeking from other industries. And uh, she joined in 2009, uh, where she oversaw many projects and now is the president and CEO of Genective. So we're very lucky to have her speaking on her experience tonight as well. Um, before we get to the main part of tonight's event, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, chairman and CEO of the U.S. Heartland China Association, Governor Bob Holden. Um, Governor Holden is a long-term advocate of working with the youth and uh, always tells me about the importance of education. So uh, Governor Holden, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jason and, and Betsy and Linda. Delighted to have you participating tonight. Uh, the, the crowd that the uh, is participating this evening, you're in for a real treat because uh, uh, Betsy, I've known for a number of years in a lot of different ways, extremely successful in everything that she has done from a mosaic pro project to metropolitan uh, efforts in, in the St. Louis area. And her book is, is a tremendous asset. I might recommend all of you to, to consider. And of course, with Linda, new member of our board, uh, but I've been impressed with her from the first time that uh, we met. Uh, and what I like about both of these uh, individuals is they're true leaders. They understand what the issues are, what needs to be done, and they're willing to, to get engaged and figure out a way to, to solve it. As we're, we all know, uh, the world that we're in today, uh, there is much difference and conflict that have to be uh, uh, adjudicated in a way that is a, po a positive outcome uh, for all cultures. And these two uh, ladies are tremendous leaders in their own right, but they also bring a tremendous amount of understanding and, and vision of where we need to go in the future. And so with that, let me welcome both of them to this program and the other programs that we do. And uh, I look forward to listen to these two ladies who are true leaders on behalf of all of us in Missouri, the United States Heartland China Association, and the people of the United States and around the world. So Jason, uh, good luck and you, you're in for a real treat with both of these uh, uh, true leaders in our state. 
Thank you, Governor Holden. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Linda, I will uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. It is truly a honor and a pleasure for me to be at today's events. Governor Holden, uh, the former governor of the state of Missouri, for which I am a state resident three times for now, I always known him as a, a strong and persistent supporter to constructive China-US relationship. That's like Bob said, that's how we got to meet each other is because we were in common events, is really promoting the communication collaboration between China and the United States. And Betsy, I got to know Betsy, this is over a decade ago, when Betsy just left his, um, her VP job and, um, and Nestle, and it started something no one have ever done before. It's called the St. Louis Mosaic Project. She had an audacious goal of wanting to make St. Louis the region with the fastest growing foreign-born population by 2020. So that time, the year was 2013, almost 10 years ago. And she met that goal in 2016. Unfortunately, because of some of the government policy um, right after that, I think St. Louis, we lost that number one status, right? So Betsy get that started again. The goal is by 2025, we want the St. Louis, Missouri area have the uh, fastest growing immigration population in the United States. Um, I got to know Betsy when she was just starting the project. I signed up as her volunteer ambassador. Betsy, I'm probably among the, the first five to support that project. I continue to support that project until today. And uh, last year, Betsy did something no one ever did before again. She wrote this book specifically for foreign-born individuals like myself to, to find jobs in the United States. Thank you, Betsy, for all you have done for the immigrant, for foreign-born students. And it's really a, a great pleasure and honor to be with you for the same events today. Um, I also appreciate the United States Heartland China Association gave me this opportunity today to be here. I feel like I'm going back to meet myself 20 years ago. I came to United States 20 years ago, 2002. Exactly 20 years ago as a, as a student. So I was in your seats before, and uh, I pretty much walked us through every step you've already stepped into, or maybe in the coming year. Um, I wanted just to share three quick learnings I've got over those two decades in the United States. Um, number one, you will be okay. You will find jobs. I say that because when I came to the United States in 2002, I graduated in 2004, the unemployment rate in the United States is 10%. Today, it is 3.9. As much I was stressed out at that time as a job seeker, a international students need all the sponsorship, go through all the paperwork, I feel like I'm equally anxious today as a CEO of a company, because we cannot find enough good people. We simply cannot hire fast enough. So I just wanted you to always keep that in mind. There's always opportunity and you will be okay because I did it and I trust you can do that too. Um, my number two learning is uh, there's no shortcut. It's gonna take hard work. This is where we go back to reality. And this is something particularly for foreign born because we uh, spend the years of our life before United States somewhere else. We, we're, we're, we're doing other equally important things. We're learning equally important language like Chinese. But when we came as foreign born individuals, there are particularly challenges. Now, being on the employer side, I know it is a lot of time, energy, and uh, resource needed to sponsor H-1B. So that is something the employers will have to do. Therefore, in this whole process of finding jobs, there will be additional challenges. So just be prepared for some hard work. So again, from my own case, 
I actually, 2004, because job was so hard to find for everyone, including the U.S. citizen. I actually don't know how many applications I made. I only know I got a lot more thank you letters than offer letters. Uh, but at the end of the day, we all can just do one job. We only need one job. But so so uh, be prepared for some uh, hard work. And I wish there was someone at that time has written this book. This book to me came 20 years too late. Um, highly recommending some of the learnings uh, in, in Betsy's book. And I know she will be talking about a lot of them today. Um, the third thing I want to share with you, this is something always in my mind as a, uh, a Chinese student. There's always a struggle. There's always a question. Do I go back? Do I stay? I will share with you, it is probably a lifelong question. So don't worry if you don't have an answer, don't get stressed out. We are lucky to be affiliated with two of the greatest nations in the world. So again, you'll be okay. And no decision is irreversible. The key is figure out what you really want to do in long run. What is the first step you like to take? Work very hard on that, going back to my point number two, and you will be okay, going back to my point number one. I will stop here. I will uh, turn the uh, stage to Betsy. Thank you, Linda, and thank you for being the one that really helped support this book and the concept of doing this talk. And that's really appreciated in conjunction with the United States Heartland China Association. It's exciting to be here, and it's exciting um, as we think about the world to think about why would someone like me write this book? Um, and, and you might say, why did this book happen? Because there has been no book like this. Uh, there has been no book written to help foreign born people find a US job. And the question is, why would I write it? And really this was a personal mission and passion that happened last year, just about this time, as we were starting to get vaccines and I was working from home, I was thinking, I'm on LinkedIn a lot and I put a lot of tips about finding jobs on LinkedIn. And a number of people wrote me on LinkedIn and they said, Betsy, you've been helping hundreds of people find jobs. You put all these tips, why don't you write a book so that it's easier for people to find out this information. And I had never thought about writing a book. It was never one of my goals in life. I had never thought about doing it. I, I didn't know how to do it. And um, so really I was doing some deep thinking last March um, about how could I have a bigger impact? And I think this is something that each of you will be thinking about in your life. How do you make an impact? How do you make an impact with your family, your friends, your community, your work? And I knew I was making an impact with Mosaic for St. Louis, but it felt to me that if I could share this knowledge with more people around the country or even internationally, I could be more helpful. And that would be a personal, personal passion of mine to make a difference. One of the things that I find is when people contact me and they say, Betsy, I have a question about finding a job. It's about my resume. But then I wanna say to them, but it's about these things too, but they don't even know to ask me or we don't have enough time to discuss all those. So I thought to myself, let me see if I can organize my ideas and put it in a book. So I started writing. I started putting down all the stories. And I think some of you have already gotten the book and some of you will be able to get the book, but really it's a collection of stories about what did I see? What happened to people? What made them successful? What worked and what didn't work? The other thing that I thought was important in addition to the stories was I felt the timing would be right. Just like when Linda said, when unemployment is high, it's harder to have enthusiasm in the United States about having foreign born people get jobs. But when the employment rate is low and there are signs up and jobs and the postings and Linda's company, everyone's company is looking for people, then that is politically a good time to talk about helping foreign born people find jobs. So it was a combination of unemployment was low, immigration under our new administration was opening up and under the current president, while not as many things have been opened as I would like, there are many changes and we can talk about some of them that are gonna make it better. For example, recently there was a change, 22 new STEM categories were added 
so that OPT STEM, there are more degrees and majors that will qualify for staying for three years. That is a very big deal and makes more opportunities for all of you. And then the vaccines were coming and now we've had so many people vaccinated that going to work and having hiring be a better activity was all gonna be positive. So my mission was, how can I help you? How can I help our economy? Not just in St. Louis, but around our country. What can I do that's going to really make a difference? So I started writing. And the way the book got organized is basically it's in six stages. And that's the way that I have seen the process go. And then in the back of the book, there are some special chapters for special groups and international students have a special chapter. Um, but so do refugees. There's a chapter on immigration. So the process in the book really helps everybody, but the back of the book has some very special cases. The way the stages work is something that I find really insightful about what I have learned from all the international people that I have worked with. And the first chapter is about the stress that you face. Um, you know, and before this session started, Jason and Linda and the governor and I were talking about, you know, what's going on in the Ukraine today. And there's stress and you may be connected to Ukraine. You may have other relationships. There is stress for international people. You have stresses with your family across the world. You may be on the WhatsApp or chatting with them and you are connected around the world in a way that a lot of native born people are not. So you have stresses of connectivity. You have stresses of your visa and your language and your family. And other people may never understand the stresses that you go through. And actually one person wrote me and she said that she was tearful when she read that chapter, that stage, because she said she understood that I understood how much stress the international people are under because it's really different than when I talk to native born US people about their job search, they just have no idea about the stress. The second area has to do with the pre-interviewing. How do you prepare? And that's something that, that we'll talk a little bit more about and I'm gonna get Linda's opinion on it, but there's a lot of discussion about how do you prepare? How do you make a network? How do you have LinkedIn? How do you make connections? So how do you get yourself prepared for the process of interviewing? Uh, it, it's not just you think you wanna interview, you apply and then you get an interview. There's a lot of pre-work that happens and we'll talk about that. Then there's discussion about the interviewing process and how that works and how can you be prepared for different kinds of interviews? What do you do if it's a Zoom interview? What if it's in person? How do you do that? And then we talk about job offers. Um, in your own home country, you may or may not feel comfortable negotiating or coming back with a request if the job offer comes in one way and you are hoping that other parts of that job offer could be negotiable. And I talk about the way you can use language and what is the right way? So if Linda makes you a job offer, how do you go back to Linda in a way that shows that you really want to work there, but you have a few things you're hoping maybe they could uh, negotiate or make a little better for you? And, and how does that work? And how do you do it in a way that, that is successful um, in our culture here versus if you accept the job as is, maybe that's okay. Or if you come back too strongly or you don't say the right thing, the Linda or the Lindas of the world may think, oh, she doesn't want to work for me, or he's not serious, and maybe I made a mistake, and, and that's not what you want. And then I talk about working in a company and what it means when you actually go to work in that company, and how do you find your right place? How do you get ahead? How do you bring your whole self to work, but also understand the culture that you are, that you are in, and that that's really important that you can understand how to move up in that company and what's important in the American culture. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there are issues about these special cases like international students. So I'm gonna go back to a few of these topics and then I'm gonna read a few cases. But the first area that I wanted to talk about is this area of before you get into the interview, before you get there, there is all these issues of making relationships, networking, using LinkedIn, and how do you broaden your network? And this is something that is extremely important because international students often um, stay together and they stay with those that they're comfortable with, but those are not people that are gonna help you find a job. And what is important is that you look at ways you can connect in the community or through LinkedIn. And, and maybe Linda will have a thought about community connections and, and how can you connect in some way, either in person or virtually 
with some community organizations where local people will get to know you as a person. And in that case, they will then be more willing to help you when you need to network for a job. So Linda, maybe you have an idea about forming some community relationships. Yeah, so um, Betsy, this is going back to 20 years ago. I would say um, my university, Northwestern, is great for many aspects, but at that time, they don't really do um, a great job to, to help the international students mingled into the community. And that's actually later on as an alumni uh, for Northwestern, I continue to provide that feedback and then try to help with that situation. I do learn from some of our local university in the, um, in the St. Louis area, for example, Betsy, you're very familiar with University of Missouri, St. Louis. They actually um, actively going out, seeking out people in the community that can be helpful for their international students. So um, how I got in touch with AMSA, University of Missouri St. Louis again, was someone signed up for a career fair for the international students there, but couldn't show up last minute, asked me, can you go? I went there last minute. I ended up meeting the uh, associate dean of the business school. I was there helping answer questions and representing my company, uh, Monsanto, at that time. Um, then I struck a conversation with the associate dean and uh, sharing my background. And he is asking whether I would be willing to help to do some coaching, maybe even come to the uh, classroom. I ended up did a volunteer executive in residence for the international MBA program. So I would say take full advantage of what your school may be offering you some of the organized organize the events like the, the career fair for international students and uh, keep developing the, uh, there are students I met there. We did talk afterwards. Some of them was uh, students in the AMSAL classroom, others actually from other universities like SLU because it is also, uh, I'd encourage you not just uh, uh, in your own school, pay attention to what is being organized in the neighboring school because most likely uh, those universities are willing to be open to students from uh, from neighboring universities. Go there, check them out, making connections. I do say um, if someone shows the a willingness to to be follow up, on, uh, really really follow up, and uh, asking for is it the would it be possible to stay connected on LinkedIn? Um, what's the what's your preferred way to stay connected? Uh, I welcome everyone to reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn. That's the best way to, uh, to, to reach me. Yeah, I'm going to add one of the things that we see is that, for example, in our community, we have an Asian American Chamber of Commerce and they have events and they have a lot of local people who work and live in the region who are members. And when they meet an international student, they form a connection. And that is a way that you can naturally, authentically form a relationship. We also, for example, there may, there's an American Marketing Association. If your degree is in marketing, you can attend an event virtually or in person for the Marketing Association for your community. And then you would have met me because I was a marketing executive at Nestle. You would have met me and then you can follow up and you might say, Betsy, could I come spend an afternoon and just see what you do? You have to be a little bit bold and you have to ask and just figure out how you get yourself connected, kind of attach yourself to somebody. Um, we also have an engineering club here. There are every, there's an accounting organization. There's many professional groups and you have to just kind of find a way. So even if there's, there might be a charge to attend an event and let's say there's the American Marketing Association is having a speaker over lunch next week and maybe it's $40 and you don't have even the money to do it. You might call them and say, I would love to help check people in and be a volunteer if I could come to your lunch. And maybe they say yes, maybe they say no, but you have to be bold enough to put yourself where you want to be if you want to meet people. If you're in the accounting field, how do you find that accounting group or that association, young accountants of your community or any group, but you need to find local people who take an interest in you and in your career because then 
they will in turn make other introductions for you. And that is the magic that happens when you break out. And then you start adding them to your LinkedIn community. And truly, LinkedIn is really magic for the job hunt in the United States. Um, you have to develop your own LinkedIn profile. You need it to be smart and talk about what you're doing. You should be posting things that you think about. If I'm posting something, you can comment on it. And then I respond back to you and we start a relationship. But LinkedIn is very important. In addition, you can have a picture on LinkedIn and you don't have a picture on a resume. And so make sure you have a good picture where you're smiling and looking approachable. Don't look strict, don't look severe. And sometimes international students can look like you're very serious, but you wanna look like you're likable, friendly. Um, that's something that I talk about in the book for American companies that one of the really important aspects of being successful in American company is being likable. And that's not always something that if you're really smart in these international students like you are, you often are coming as the brightest from your universities, from your home country. You've always been at the top. You are so smart and you wanna think you're hired and you're gonna be successful because you are so smart. But the answer is it may be that if you're smart but not likable, they will keep you in the same job and you will not get a new job or promoted. And so this idea about being likable is something really important when you're looking for a job, but also when you're being successful at the job. And I don't know, Linda, what's been your experience as you have learned how this idea about being likable fits into the American way of doing business? Uh, yeah, Bessie, I, I can get to that. It's just you're mentioning about the Nazi um, uh, reminding me something. Can I, can I go back to that community yeah. really quick? To me, uh, the best community I've leveraged has been my alumni network. Because uh, I, when I when I was uh, looking for a job, and one time I made a trip to St. Louis, I was very very intentional. I reached out to all the alumni I can find in Edward Jones in Nestle Purina. I actually Betty, I did I did went in to meet one of the um, a um, a Kellogg alumni who happens to be an international student from Columbia. I remember he was in the marketing department. I ended up there was no open at that time, but it was still very good. Just go visit and uh, meet alumni, uh, feel being supported, encouraged by uh, particularly some international um, alumni. And I, I visited on that same trip, I visited Emerson as well, Edward Jones, even though I didn't end up with any, any job, but I learned something from uh, meeting each and every one of them. And I often say that that alumni network uh, it could be from a university or an experience from China, and you have some network here. It could be from the college or the university that you've gone to here in another city. You know, if you ask people to have a cup of coffee or tea or to take a meeting with you, um, if it's a random person reaching out to me, I might, I might not. But I went to Wellesley College. I went to Harvard Business School. If somebody from those places asks me to meet with me, 100%, I would always meet with them. And so it's a very important lesson, but to use anything you have in common, you know, a, a country in common, a relationship, a friend in common, anything you have in common is going to make someone want to see you, want to help you. And that's how you're going to hear about other openings. That's why they're going to make a personal um, pitch for someone to talk to you and interview. Because oftentimes when there's an opening, there might be a hundred resumes and they might decide to do phone interviews for 10 and then interview four in person. So how do you go from 100 to the 10? And that's because someone like Betsy or Linda or Jason writes somebody, calls somebody and says, would you make sure you speak to this person? Because I know they're really good and it would be great if they could be in the group that you do a phone interview for. So just because somebody calls and says, I wanna put that person into your group, you can move from the 100 to the 10. And that's because someone has a relationship with you. And so LinkedIn is one of the very important ways that you can do it. Um, but often you need to find the right way. Even when people send, you can go onto your phone or online and you can put a personal note. And so if you put a note and say, Betsy, I heard you speak last night. I would like to connect with you. I am much more likely than if someone just, I just get a notice that says, bing, somebody wants to connect. So it's up to you to make those relationships and to warm that up. So. I guess my point is 
that LinkedIn and broadening your network, not among your own international student group, but among anybody you can find, the people that live in the apartment next to you, somebody that you know from the grocery store, somebody that's in a network that you're in, a professor, um, you might have a roommate who has a local family, uh, getting all those people in your LinkedIn network, because then what happens with LinkedIn is if you say, oh, I see a job opening at Barnes Jewish Hospital and you put that in, it may pop up that one of your connections works there or knows someone there. And then you say, ah, Betsy, you know someone there. Would you make an introduction for me? So you can use that to your advantage, but it only happens if you build that LinkedIn network before you need it. And so that's something really important is to think about how do you build that so it works in your advantage. Any final thought on that networking? And then we're going to talk about the interview process. Jason or Linda, any thoughts about networking yeah. and LinkedIn? Yeah, the, the, to, to, uh, to just make sure I covered a likable one. You are absolutely right. Being likable is super important. There are different ways to be likable. The, the smile you mentioned is definitely very important. Have a, have, have a, a, a good picture, a smiling picture. Um, I always found um, for all my time living in five different countries on three continents, there is one thing that is true. Uh, even if you don't speak each other's language, when you put a smile on your face before you even talk, before you say anything, you got almost, almost all the time, you got a smile back. That is a great way to, to start the conversation, to start connecting. I would also say another part is, uh, is, is being likable is, is about being, being positive. Here, I go back to, um, we are as foreign born individuals, we can have a lot to complain about, but that's not gonna help us to be likable. It's actually not gonna be, be help of seeking jobs, making connections. So think about, focus on the bottle, what they say in English, that is half full. Talking about your unique experience, how you can make a contribution in a very unique way. So smile all the time and be positive. And one of the things I talk about in the book is what are the topics that are good to build a small talk with me? Um, and the things that you need to think about, such as travel, sports, restaurants, food, um, current topics. I mean, if it is the day that your baseball team has opening day in your city and you don't know it. And I, actually, I spoke to a group of international students the day the Cardinals had their opening day. And I said, what's happening in St. Louis? And they didn't know. And so you have to know what's happening in your community so that you can have that small talk that builds a relationship. Um, I call that also the airplane talk. You know, if you and I are going to sit next to each other for two hours, what are we going to talk about? And how do we find some things in common that we enjoy? And so that's something that, that is um, kind of special. Um, I think I'm going to uh, read a couple of case studies from the book that talk about some of these issues and, and kind of help you understand um, why the case studies in the book make it real and make you have a better chance to just understand what happened to somebody and why. So this is one that's about Kung, a marketing student from Vietnam. Kung was a marketing international student who had a non-STEM degree in marketing. He was doing his one year of optional practical training work in a company, and he expected that he would return to Vietnam at the end of the year when his visa expired. He met an American citizen and he got engaged so his fiance visa followed by marriage allowed him to stay. He ultimately became an American citizen. And I think what the point of this story is, is sometimes you think you're gonna be going home and so you don't build a network, um, but you might end up staying. You don't know if you're going to end up staying or you might end up leaving. So you need to think about how to prepare for many different situations that you may be looking at for the job market. So here's another case study where um, there's a team of international students from a local university who do a group project. And actually this is something that was a project done for me, an example from my experience. A team of international students did a final capstone research project for their degree. This was done for the Mosaic project and the students did company interviews in the community. They did reviews with their workplace project supervisor, who was me, and they presented a final report. They got to see how a US organization worked. They talked with US employers and they built their confidence 
for future job searches. So if you can do a project with a local company, you can meet an executive and you might get some other entrees where you can build those relationships and get some personal learnings that in turn are going to open the doors and help you as you move forward. So then there's a case study here of Noor, an international engineering student. Noor worked through her school's designated school official and she secured a summer internship with an engineering firm under her curricular practical training. This exposed her to the workplace, broadened her network of potential contacts for her future job search. So figuring out how to use CPT and OPT is very important. And one of the things that, that I have learned over the years is that many of the international students don't learn early enough the difference of OPT STEM and non-OPT STEM. With OPT, if it's not STEM, you have one year that you can work. But if you have a STEM degree, you have a year plus two more years. And that gives you many more opportunities to talk to an employer about having you work for three years. And it's possible that you could work for three years and then return to your home country. But it's also possible in that three years that that employer is going to love you and want to apply for an H-1B visa for you and have you stay. And the way our country's immigration works, it's usually in the STEM fields that an approved visa is going to be possible. And that's why it's so interesting right now that 22 new STEM category degrees were opened up because there's more opportunities to make sure that you are in a major that can be qualified as OPT STEM. For example, economics is usually not a STEM degree, but econometrics is. And so a number of data analytics programs are STEM. Um, and so finding that out so that you know where you can go and how you can present that to an employer is really important. The other thing that I'm seeing now with the fact that the pandemic has had a silver lining that many companies and people like myself can work from home. A lot of employers who used to say, well, I don't know that I would sponsor you for an H-1B. It's possible if you work for them for one or two or three years, they may continue to have you work out of the country for them and you would keep and you would become remote for them. And so their ability to hire you may be greater now than it's ever been. And I think that is a huge opportunity for you to make your case and I know there's some questions about talking at job fairs and interviews, if the employer you know, says they don't wanna sponsor a visa, but you have a lot of ways to say, I could be great. If I work for you three years, that's more than your normal employee who's US based born, and I could continue to work for you remotely. So why don't we start this? I'm gonna be a terrific employer, so employee. So I think you have many more ways to tell your story and to be very compelling when these companies need someone to be hired. Another case study that I'm gonna to read to you is about job shadowing. And this is about Sanvi, a marketing manager from India. It's a job shadowing experience. Job shadowing is a way for someone to spend a short time, possibly one day or a few half days, watching alongside a working professional. In this case, Sanvi spent a day with a local marketing executive at the headquarters of a retail chain. Sanvi was able to hear the way the US marketing team talked about products, pricing, promotion, and the placement of the products. She heard about the company's e-commerce growth and she got a sense of the way the US workplace operates. This experience helped her interview more successfully in the future for a job at different organizations. And so sometimes it's hard to get an internship. Uh, sometimes companies say, well, we only hire interns if we know that we can hire them full-time. Maybe you can get a shadowing experience. That often does not have to go through the HR department, because if you say to Linda, you know, could I shadow one of your teammates for half a day? She might say, okay, um, because you're making a smaller ask. So you can be creative in what you're asking for to get in the door, to get some experience and to get that feeling that you're understanding what a company really feels like. And then if you spend half a day with someone, they may find you to be a really great person. And that's one of the words I like to use with international students which is the word irresistible. And if you remember one thing from this, remember the word irresistible, because you want to make yourself irresistible to an employer, that, that they are willing to spend an extra several thousand dollars to file the papers, that they're willing to get an immigration lawyer, that they're willing to wait a few months for you, they're willing to let you work remotely, they're willing to let you go home longer for a family, because you are irresistible. And that's because you're so smart, but also because you're likable and you're contributing and that they just love you. 
And so you can't just be good. You can't just be good at your job, but I think you want to figure out how to be irresistible. So I don't know, Linda, what do you think about what yeah. you've seen with people being irresistible? Yeah, that's you kept jogging my memory. Actually, one thing now I recall is in St. Louis again, because that was one of my target market. I mentioned I wrote to all the alumni I can find in St. Louis company. Uh, I, I came visit. And uh, one thing I did is I, uh, I create myself an independent study opportunity. I was taking a uh, integrating integrated marketing class and uh, and uh, um, Northwestern. It was a joint program offered by, by the Kellogg School of Management and the Medell School of Communication. So uh, the professor happens to be have quite a bit of connection in the um, in the in the publishing industry. Then I just said, "Do you know anyone who who is working in the media industry in St. Louis?" Then he said. The publisher of the St. Louis Post Dispatch, so he helped to make the connection. I just offered for um, this course I'm taking. I can I can do it as an independent study. I would like to um, to do a um, a digital strategy for St. Louis uh, the Post Dispatch. That is between 2003 and 2004. It is actually a very very disruptive idea at that time. The Post-Dispatch was uh, one of the largest well-known, uh, that's that's owned by the Pulitzer uh, family. Uh, they're, they're doing pretty well at that time. They have really haven't been thinking about online, digital. So here is a student from Northwestern saying, I think you really think of, you, you really need to think about this. And here's why, let me come to spend some time with your people and see how your operations, let me share with you some of my idea. So um, I ended up did a, a independent study on, uh, on St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Uh, again, I didn't get a job laid out with them, um, but I thought it just tells me people are a lot more open than we, than we thought. It, it just, it, it takes initiative just to ask. I think that's a great way to, to show that if you have a, an idea or a solution or there's a pain point and with all the different new issues now, whether it's artificial intelligence or uh, electronic cars, whatever it may be, you know, if you have knowledge and learning and you bring an idea, um, you can start a conversation, a project, a independent study. But I imagine that when Linda was there, they thought she was pretty irresistible. Um, and that when she, they wanted to ask potentially for a recommendation for her somewhere else, or if she wanted an introduction to somebody else in the community, do you think that the people at the paper she did the independent study for would make a new introduction? And the answer is yes. And so it's, it's not always just a linear, I want that job at that place. And is this one thing, but it's, 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 it's finding these ways to get your skills, to get your network, and then figure out how it's going to add into your kind of maybe one to five year work plan. And it could be in the United States, it could be in your home country, it may be coming back. And with that, I'm gonna read a little study about a social work student who was looking for a job that would result in sponsorship to stay in the United States beyond the one year optional practical training. She evaluated the kinds of organizations that have international roles for which sponsorship might be possible and other work opportunities where the employer can apply for a visa through hospitals and certain research organizations. She got an OPT work opportunity that related to her social work. And then she kept looking for specific roles that would allow her to stay longer. She ultimately returned to her home country, but she did have the benefit of one year of work experience to build her resume for the future. And this is something that a lot of uh, the international students don't always understand that the visa lottery for the H-1B visas is something that companies have to go through and there are 85,000 visas every year, and there's usually 200,000 applicants, and it's a lottery. But there are organizations that don't need to go through that lottery. Um, hospitals, universities, certain international organizations, if you fit into their job categories, they can apply for you if they, and they don't have to go through the lottery. So there's some learning to be done. Uh, for example, one of our St. Louis University um, computer IT 
graduates who was from a European country, she got hired by one of our hospitals and they immediately put through a visa because they needed her. And so um, she didn't have to go through the lottery. So there's some learning for you to do about potential employers if they are international or they're global or they're research institutions, hospitals, universities. Um, in certain jobs, you could be hired and they could apply for an H-1B for you um, and not go through that lottery system. But I do think understanding that you might have a year or three, you might go back to your home country, you might come back here. Um, it's all part of a, of a flow. And now with more teams and work around the world happening globally, I think it's gonna open some more options. The last thing that I wanna mention about international students is in the book, there's, I asked um, one of the people I know from Global Detroit to help add some expert contributions to my chapter on the international student because Global Detroit has more international students than, than we do in St. Louis that they work with. And so they have a whole chapter of their expert contributions and their tips for what really is gonna make a difference for international students. So I'm gonna highlight just a few of their tips. The first is starting early. The worst is when we hear from somebody a month before they graduate and they're like, I'm looking for a job, I wanna stay. You're like, no, it's not gonna work that way. You can't start a month before you graduate. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes that's when an international student decides they wanna stay. But you really have to start early and, and think longer term about networks, relationships, experience. So again, Linda, what do you think about the whole starting early concept? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think there is, um, like, like that's you mentioned earlier on, don't wait till the interview time is your preparation. The preparation can start a lot earlier. Doing research about the company, reaching out to alumni, having a phone call, or even better if you can make a visit to the company. And, uh, um, I know I, the good thing is in business school, the school runs a schedule. It is dark. It's almost funny. The summer intern search preparation started the second day after my school started. And right after we finished the summer intern and coming back to be a second year student, the full-time recruiting started. So you really cannot be too early. Yeah, it's really important. And again, it's you just have to begin right from the beginning to think about the networks, to think about relationships and how you do it. Another tip that the Global Detroit people mentioned is preparing strong application materials. And, and I talk about it too, is that sometimes um, the international students think that exactly what the resume is gonna be enough, um, but often they wanna see some work you've done. They wanna see a project you've done. They want you to attach something. And even if they don't ask, I really love it if I'm interviewing someone and they bring something to show me in the interview. Um, I think that it really adds so much. Um, so for example, when I was at uh, Nestle Purina, if somebody walked in and we're talking about pet food, if they, if they say like, I read online that Nestle has opened a new factory in somewhere in the world, I'm like, that's good. But if they walk in the door and they put um, a can of cat food on the table and say, I picked up this can of cat food and I was wondering why your brand does this and another brand looked differently or was priced differently. And they're talking to me about something tangible. I loved it. Um, or if they would bring a research report, something they had done, a project where they had done an analysis or something that they had done a report about. Because often if you bring something that you have worked on, it makes you come alive as an interviewer. Instead of just saying, oh, Betsy, you know, what's Betsy going to ask me? And then I'm going to answer and she's going to ask me. But if you say, I want to share with you something I'm proud of, a project I did or a team project, or I did a shadowing experience and I wrote about it, or maybe I do a blog. If you might be blogging. You might have a social media. You may have a, an Instagram following that's really interesting about what you're doing. If you bring something to show, whether it's a Zoom interview or in person, you can make the interview come alive. And so I think that's something... To, you can break the boundaries, I, I guess is my point. You don't have to be rigid. And the more you bring your authentic interests and self, you're going to make it a dynamic experience and someone is gonna really want you. So another point, leverage your networking, practice your interviewing. And again, do practice interviews, 
find a mentor, find someone that, that you know, and practice the interviewing. Uh, look up the kind of questions you're likely to be asked, and then make sure you have good answers and that you're going to be succinct. And when you understand the interview process, and I talk about it in the book, that there are two kinds of interviews. Sometimes they want to know in sequence what you've done, and other times the interviewer is going to dig deep, it's called the STAR method, where they dig deep into tell me what you did and how you did it, because they don't want to make a mistake and just hear about something that you did, but then not dig deeply into what kind of a team member were you and what did you do. And I think this is something particularly that I see with international students and particularly Chinese students, is sometimes being too humble about what you do and what you contribute. And on one hand, you don't wanna be bragging to the point where it was like, I, 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 I. But if you say the team did this, the team did this, the team did this, I'm not gonna know what you did. So I think you need to practice being able to say, I was part of a really good team project and I added this. My contribution in this way was really valuable. So you need to find the right way to brag about yourself, but also put it in the context of being a good team player. And, and again, I see international students being too humble and, and not putting yourself out enough to share the part that you do. And, and that's something that I really want to encourage you to think about. So I don't know, Linda, what do you think about that? What have you seen? You can never uh, be overprepared. Uh, one thing I just want to add is one recommendation. Actually, do the mock interview and record yourself on video. Then replay it. Sometimes you will find things you, you, you never realize you're doing that. Be looking, look, not looking at interviewers, looking at someone else, rolling the eyes, or uh, looked very rigid or very serious. Like, um, like what Betsy was saying, not enough smiling. I, I think doing the video recording, which is much easier to do today than when it was 20 years ago for me. <laughs> um, good things my school, the career management office did provide that opportunity. That's a big setup to help people to do mock inter interview in front of a camera today. Yeah. I recommend everyone do that. And I think you can, you can also now, because you can share your screen. If you're interviewing with me on Zoom, you can share Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, and I just noticed there was a question about being too humble. I think you have to think about how to, um, to not be so humble. And it might be that you showcase your work or a project or how you contributed to that team. And, and think about show and tell, um, you know, that you might be able to demonstrate or show a picture of it or show a design that you did. Um, and, then, and then, again, you know, elaborate a little bit about the value that you added uh, in a way that makes it uh, comfortable for you but also that make sure that, that if I'm the person interviewing, I have no doubt that you were the contributor. Um, so, you know, there's, it, it's a fine line, um, but again, make sure you lift up your uh, ability to talk about yourself because, you know, I wanna know what you did because if you're gonna join our organization, I wanna be sure that you're going to be the one that can do the work and that you're gonna be proud of it and, and do a really good job of the work. And so I think that that's, that's something that is extremely important. And it's something that you're going to see also when you join within the company. A lot of companies are going to want to know, how are you going to grow? And if you just put your head down and do a good job and don't tell your boss what you did or put it forward, when you have your performance reviews in a U.S. company, they need to know what you did. Um, and that's also a reason why in the book, I encourage you when you join an organization to join their employee resource groups. Sometimes they're called business resource groups, a BRG. Sometimes they're called an employee resource group. So for example, at Monsanto Bayer, they had an, an Asian group. And sometimes uh, people, you might say, well, I don't need that, I'm fine, I'm good in my job, and, and I don't have any interest in being part of that group. But I will challenge you because one of the reasons, if you do, it's not that you shouldn't join other groups. They might have a group that's helping with the United Way fundraising. Great, go do that. But within a group like an Asian group within an organization, you can be a leader more quickly. You can put programs together. You can get the eye of senior management as being a leader within that group as well. And that might happen earlier and faster for you than in the broader groups. And so you can add that to your skill set and you can show that you're a leader. And sometimes now, because companies are really trying to encourage this diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, they are looking for people who are going to lead the way to help them be more diverse, more multicultural. And so Sometimes the, the company may say it, but they're not really ready. On the other hand, if you're there, you need to find ways to suggest 
things that could be done. So you might be joining a company um, or you might be an intern at a company um, that's never done anything to celebrate any Asian culture. Well, if there's an Asian event or Lunar New Year, you might be able to say, you know, maybe this is a good year that we could have a, a small recognition of something that has to do with the Asian culture. They might say, no, I don't think so. We're not ready. I, we don't think we can do that. And you might say, okay, then maybe we'll talk about it next year. So it's never a matter of yes or no, but it's, they may not be ready. But if you're viewed as someone who is bringing ideas forward, that may be on the campus with an, org, an international student organization, an Asian student organization, a Hispanic organization, um, you're gonna be seen as a problem solver, as someone that would be great to have on the team, as someone that is going to really add value. And again, you'll be irresistible and someone to say, I want her on my team, I want him on my team. And those are some of the things that, that I think are gonna set you apart. So those are some of the things that, that I talk about in the book and I give you the language to use and try to make it so that you can feel comfortable and more confident that, that you have everything you need to be successful and that you're gonna find a job, you're gonna convince that employer and you will be a winner. So with that, I'm going to see if uh, Jason or Linda have a final comment and then we'll take some questions that were sent to us in advance and, and see if we can, again, answer a few questions and um, bring some additional value to you. Linda? Can I, yeah, can I agree more? Um, the importance of uh, the, the ERG, the Employee Resource Group, or some some places called it Affinity Group. I'm I'm being the um, president for the Chinese Association, Chinese Employee Association for General Motors. That was a bit easier because GM was very big on engineering. Uh, there was a large organization already established when I was there. Then I was also VP. For the Monsanto Asian connection, when I joined the Monsanto, I joined the commercial organization. This is the now that the scientist the engineering world is US commercial. And I actually initiated the first ever Lunar New Year celebration in the US commercial organization, which is predominantly white male organization. But you know, pleasant surprise, everyone loved it. And people showing up, my own boss. Where uh, a, a a a Chinese uh, a a Chinese jacket my my father <laughs> happened to wear when he visited here it was it was wonderful you'll be um, be uh, surprised at how open people are actually are welcoming um, this type of uh, uh, initiative now this make me think about the first point that he, you were making right looking at your local community uh, people who help presidents vice president of the employee resource group is likely play a role in their community. So myself was also on the board of the Asian American Chamber of Commerce, the organization Betsy uh, mentioned. We do organize events for the students as well. So, well, when you already got hired, how do you leverage business resource group to, to help you to grow in the company with your students and just paying attention who is um, who are the president of those organizations already in the community and reach out to them? I would say uh, this would be a great connection resource to tap into. You could even find out if there's a company that you're interested in, you could find out if they have a network and you could find out if they have an Asian network within that organization and who's heading it. And you could connect with that person on LinkedIn and just find a way to, to make that connection. Jason, do you have any thought from what you've seen on that? I do. Yeah. First of all, Betsy, thank you so much again. There's so many aspects of everything you said tonight that I, I really think are helpful and really profound. Not even for international students, I think also for domestic students. I think a lot of people, a lot of young people really don't understand all the preparation work that's necessary going into an interview. Um, as kind of moderator, I'll, I'll use my privilege to kind of talk about a little personal anecdote. Um, back in the day, I was applying for a job abroad. And I was really, I thought I was really prepared. I was really excited and I got there and I'll be honest, it was one of the most horrible experiences of my life. Not because I was unqualified, but because I wasn't socially prepared for all the things I didn't expect. I didn't know how to handle the dinner etiquette. I didn't know how to handle what comes after. Um, there's just so many things that I think are hard, especially when you're not in that environment culturally that people really don't understand. So I appreciate you making space at the beginning for talking about stressors because finding a job, especially if you're speaking your second language or if it's a foreign culture to you, it can be very, very intimidating and very scary. So, so thank you so much again. 
Um, maybe I'll turn to some of the questions we received tonight. Um, the, the first one being, uh, I've noticed um, there's a lot of anxiety, we'll say, around the whole visa question. Uh, one question we received is how and when do I address me requiring a visa sponsorship for my employment, employment during my interview uh, to my future employer? And they, they, they are referring specifically to an H-1B here. So when in that process do you think is a good time to bring that up? So the, the visa is a very, it's very challenging because often the hiring manager um, may not understand the visa process and they just think they wanna hire you, but they don't understand that your the broader company may have uh, policies either for or negative about the visa process. A lot of the companies also don't realize that they can hire you under, you stay on your F visa for one year on OPT or three years, you stay under your F visa for your OPT STEM. And so they don't even have to sponsor you or even discuss sponsoring you. They can hire you under that. Uh, you may want to understand whether they will or won't want to sponsor you in the future, but you know, for some international students, if they could get hired for one year or three years and then return to their home country, that would be good as well. So I, I think the question is, if you want to push them into deciding in the beginning, if they will sponsor you for a visa, that's delicate. Um, and I think you need to ideally look at something like myvisajobs.com to see if the company has sponsored visas in the past. Um, look at their employees on LinkedIn and have they sponsored visas? So you can usually find out if they've sponsored visas before, and that's an indication that for certain jobs they do. But if it's a company that has never done it before, that's where you might engage somebody uh, in the community that understands this better because there, it, it, it could be more challenging because you might need to get hired and then work for them for a year or two for them to love you and then decide to spend the money and the fees to then apply for you for the H-1B. So sometimes it happens at the beginning, Sometimes it happens after they fall in love with you in the first year that they then decide to invest in that process. Um, but we have a lot of companies in St. Louis um, and on the Mosaic website, we have gold employers and silver and the gold ones are those that have sponsored visas and the silver are those that have not. But I will say of all the silver companies that are listed as saying they do not sponsor visas, almost all of them I know at some point have sponsored a visa for somebody who was so irresistible that they did it. Um, because they broke the rules. So again, some do it more generally and some, you know, it's very rare, but it is, it is hard because sometimes if, at the career fairs, for example, sometimes you'll go to the front of the line and they say, well, we won't sponsor a visa and you just have totally wasted your time. Some of the universities at the career fairs will make the employer say, put on their tag, whether they will or they won't sponsor a visa. So that as a student, you spend your time with those that have said they will sponsor a visa. But I guess I think right now with this ability for remote work, I just think maybe there's gonna be a more openness that you know, if you work for them for a year or two or three, and then they do or don't sponsor, you may continue to work for them. And then as the immigration opens up, there are more things happening right now for the national, um, the waivers for national interest right now for self-sponsored visas. We also, the, the O visa, which is like the outstanding visa where um, you can sponsor yourself and it used to be you had to be like the world expert of the B12 vitamin. But now if you are known for something and you are well known and have some documentation, you may be able to build your case right now better than ever to get an O visa. Um, and that's something that you should talk to your university about, the immigration team at your university, your international student advisor. There may be some immigration lawyers, but, but you have a better chance right now to even have self uh, ability to sponsor for a visa with your skill sets in the international student, particularly if you're in one of our science fields that our country needs. There's an openness and our current president is making the, the pathway open for that right now. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like a lot of homework is needed, needed to be done ahead of time, no, knowing the company, knowing where you are and what you need. Um, and I understand that can be challenging. One student writes that uh, they're currently holding an F1 visa. Um, and they want to apply for a company that they know doesn't sponsor visas. Um, they want to know if, if it's worth it. Well, if, they, if they're in the STEM field and could work three years, I think it's definitely worth it. Mm. Um, because uh, the, the national average, I think, is that uh, a native born person, the turnover in STEM fields is probably two years or under. 
um, for many of the first time employees. So you can make a case that, you know, to work for three years um, under that F visa and the employers just don't know that. They really don't understand that they could have you work for them full time under your F visa and never have to apply. So I do think there's a real opportunity to do that, um, but you have to work the education part of the employer. You have to educate them. And maybe you can find someone in the company or another person that could, if you really wanna work for that company, find someone like me or someone in, your, in that neighborhood or that city who can help you educate about why you'd be a great fit under your F visa to work for that company. Yeah. I, I think it's going back to the idea of get them to be infatuated with you so they will sponsor that visa. Um, Linda, any, any thoughts on that process? Uh, it's, it's hard to give a yes or no, it's a worth it answer. Um, I think it really depends on the situation. I personally would prefer, regardless, to get clarity, to seek clarity earlier, the better. Um, some of the the larger organization, they have lots of experience, sponsor a lot of visas over the year. So they really know what they are doing, what they can do. So when they say, uh, we don't hire, I think that that is, it, it is going to be a hard push to make. Others, like Bessie said, they simply don't know. They don't know you can work three years. So I would just recommend be very upfront from the fact you do need a visa sponsorship at a certain point. Would this work in one way or another for the company? My own case with Kellogg at that time, again, unemployment rate being 10%. At that time, the system actually forced us. It's a, we all apply through one system. It asks you first question, um, do you need a sponsorship? If I honestly say, yes, we, we do need to stay honest in this whole process it will automatically direct me only to the companies who actually sponsor, which is about 10% of the company in that time. Yeah, but you. as I said, sometimes people, you know, the companies change, sometimes someone gets married. And so, you know, things can happen even if you're with a company that says they won't sponsor. But if you get clarity that they will, and you know they have, um, like the larger companies that do, the consulting firms, the global companies, they know the jobs they do sponsor for and they have a history of it and you can see it by the people that have come before you. Yeah, all like Betsy, you said, sometimes companies simply don't know. Three years for an employer, an employer and this time, three years, not short. We'll be very happy if someone's on, on the job for three years. And often the hiring person, you know, if you meet someone and, and you apply for, the hiring manager may not know, but they have to go to the HR person. And so that makes it tricky. It's not because of the money. And sometimes the international stu students say, oh, they're, they're gonna pay me less because it costs them more. It's not the money. It, you know, it, it has to do more with getting an immigration lawyers, the time, the filing, the jobs, the lottery system. Um, you know, we as a country have a very bad system, unlike other countries like Canada that have made it much clearer. And so we are, you know, and the current administration is trying to remedy that because we need the talent that you offer. So there's going to be more attention paid to get the talent that you offer. So keep looking for the angles to do it because our the current president wants more of your talent to stay. Thank you. Um, another uh, popular question I'm noticing, in addition to to visas, uh, visas are really popular. Maybe we'll do a follow on event about that. Is um, about having experience related to the position. Um, I'll, I'll go to the question that someone wrote in the chat. And again, if, if anyone in the audience has a question, uh, please feel free, to, feel free to write that in the Q&A section below. Um, if most of your career-related experience has been outside of the US or has had a more global focus, how would you approach interview questions about how your experience translates to the US context or otherwise convince the employer that you can be successful in a US workplace? I think it comes down to understanding what the job description is and then finding ways to say that your skills are transferable. Um, and again, I would go back to trying to make it as real as, it's, as it can be. Because um, I don't know that the global experience would be that different if, you're, if it's an engineering job, a marketing job, a finance job, an accounting job, a business, I mean, you know, a science job, a social work job. I mean, I think you should be able to translate that into, how, you know, if, that, if, it, if you're working for me, just tell me why what you've done before relates to the fact that you will do a good job for what I need done. Because I'm trying to find the best person to work on my team. And so 
just show me, tell me, explain to me, and you know, make me want you to be on my team. But I do think that most experience should have a way to transfer it. Otherwise, you probably are not going to be very successful in my job. Um, if you can't find a way to tell me how you're going to do it and that you bring something to the party, um, unless you just want to prove that I'm, you're trainable, you know, you're a fast learner and you've learned other jobs quickly and I, you'll learn my job quickly and you really want to do my job, then maybe that's a tact you could take. But I would love to see what's transferable. What do you think, Linda? I agree. Also, from the employer perspective, it will be very rare if someone completely asks an apple-to-apple transferable experience to this country. Um, now, having been on the other side of the hiring table, I really think the two things are most important. Can this, is this a problem solver? Can this person think in the right way actually to solve a problem? Whatever problem it is, it actually doesn't matter. It is a way of learn and solve the problem. Then the second part is getting into the, um, the people elements. Would, would this person be a good addition to the team? Would this, this person can fit with the be collaborative? I think those are the two most important things employers are looking at. It is not about a specific experience that is so just plug and play into a job. And often companies might be interviewing someone from their own organization that works in a totally different department. So again, that person would also be coming without the exact same skills, but they're trying to prove that they will adjust, they'll learn, they'll be a good team player and that they can make that switch to do the job well. So I think that's, that's quite doable if you, if you really want that job. That's a, that's a huge point. You reminded me again, Betsy. I did five jobs in my four and a half years with General Motors. I did six or eight jobs, depends how you define them, because some role expanded, evolved in my 10 years with Monsanto. I definitely don't have all the experience when I was moving from commercial to supply chain, then to R&D, then to corporate affairs. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think many things are transferable. Good advice. I'm going to ask one last question that right. I found really interesting. Uh, we had a student ask how to look confident when speaking English. And I'm going to expand that a little bit more because I assume that they don't mean the, your language ability. I assume that they mean what are some things that you can talk about to make it seem like this, this person is really likable uh, they don't have any any restrictions when it comes to being able to interact. Um, and I'll tack on to that. In a resume or in a cover letter, um, what else is going to be is really going to separate you um, from the rest and, and kind of push away some of those things that might alienate you um, in a cultural sense? You know, I believe that you know the cover letter tailored to the job is important. Um, and a lot of jobs don't require it. They just say, you know, submit a resume, but you can, you can make the PDF and attach a cover letter. But I think when someone says, you know, I'm really interested in the Mosaic project and I'm interested in multicultural and I'm in, because I've done this and I care about what you do because of this reason. And that's why in my resume, these things relate to it. That matters compared to just sending the resume. And I, I think if they know something about me and sometimes you know who's interviewing you in advance or you don't, but you can learn about the culture of a company. There's also a debate about putting personal characteristics at the bottom of your resume. Some of the um, universities recommend to not put personal interests on a resume. I recommend that you put two or three good personal interests at the bottom. I don't like things that show that you're a loner. Um, I don't want people to say, you know, I'm a long distance runner and I'm a reader. And, you know, I want people to put down something that is, that is gonna make it easy to engage with. Um, and now if, if you are the, you know, if you're the a champion in something, I don't mean to not say it, but I think you should use the resume to want to engage someone. So if I look down and see that, you know, that they, you know, for example, if someone's, I'm a reader, but like, if I said something like, you know, I love book clubs, that sounds social. If I just said, I'm a reader, it sounds like I want to go to the corner and read. Um, but so, you know, it, putting down things that you like, if, if you like traveling, if you have a hobby, if you like to be part of a team sport, putting down a few things that are personal, what, you know, warms up your resume and makes it easier to think that you're going to have confidence because the person that you talk to, you also might pick up clues when you, if you're in someone's office, uh, you will pick up clues about them and you could say, oh, you know, you like to fish or so do I, or 
I see you've traveled somewhere. So those are the kind of things I think that you can build a relationship and build your confidence. Mm. Can, can, can I speak about particular language? Because I know whoever asked that question, I know exactly how you felt. And that's how exactly how I felt when I uh, landed in the United States. We were just actually chit-chatting about that before the session started. When I was in China, I thought my English was really good because everyone said that. I work for PricewaterhouseCoopers, a global firm with English as its working language, right? And I, I, I have a good score, um, TOEFL and the GMAT, so I can come to this country. But I felt it was really, I felt really bad when I first came here because I don't understand what people are speaking every day. Uh, primary for one thing is because there's a lot of social culture terms I just don't know. First marketing class, my marketing professor talking about launchable. I have no idea what she was talking about because in China at that time, every kid and their parents go back to home for lunch, even take a nap and go back to school. There's no such thing a launchable you bring to work or to school. And that was really hurt my confidence a lot. And uh, then there's no shortcut. Like I said, in job searching, I went out about a TV set. I don't even watch TV all the years before. I started to watch commercials. Then I start to know everything people are talking about on a daily basis um, um, in the marketing class. The second part, I was really worried about my accent. And uh, it, it is very clear when I came to the United States, I spoke English differently from the native speakers. And I was worried about what people ever understand me, but I didn't know one thing at that time, I spoke really fast. Today, I still talk fast. I'm always a fast speaker. I speak even faster when it's in Chinese. But I didn't realize I was talking really, really fast. Um, growing up, I always feel here is turning faster than here. That's why I talk fast in, in Chinese. That really hurts. We sometimes think if we, if we speak faster, we, we, we appear to be smarter. Maybe people will understand us more. It is the opposite. I learned to slow down. And uh, when, when you slow down, people don't think you're not confident enough. Actually, there are times when you slow down, it goes the other way. People think you are really confident. It's, uh, it took me many years. I was always continue to learn the language, wanted to make my accent go away somehow. Uh, but it never, because I came to the United States for grad school, right? I learned that later on too. Uh, but it really was an enlightening moment at Monsanto. Uh, one day I was chit chat with a um, American colleague. That's why the chit chat is really important. Uh, so I, I said, oh, I'm sorry. You probably didn't get it because of my accent. Um, then, um, then he said, what are you talking about? You're talking on the accent. You know, I speak zero Chinese. And uh, almost everyone around us here speaks zero Chinese. Your Chinese is a lot better than our in than our oh, your Chinese is a lot better than, than our Chinese because we're simply zero. That is really the moment I actually changed. Instead of uh, try to make my uh, my English as perfect as uh, as a native speaker, um, I'm I'm gonna be focus more on the content I deliver versus how I say that. It really drove home when Monsanto was acquired by a German company. When we started to have our CEO, uh, the divisional president is actually German. We have all the colleagues came to uh, the United States. They spoke English with a German accent. And it's also very clear, they lost the subtlety of choice of words when they switch to English. Sometimes they forgot a little bit. What are you going to say? They're thinking about the choice of word, but it does not matter. Now I am completely on the listening side and it actually doesn't matter. So I really wish I learned that from day one when I landed in the United States. Accent, it is okay. Remember, there are people around you who have no knowledge about other language you are able to speak. So I hope that helps. 
I'll say as a, um, wouldn't define myself as a native speaker or a fluent speaker of Chinese. Uh, that, that's very comforting. I, I think that oftentimes we forget that, you know, language is really about communication. It's not about the grammar and it's not about uh, pronouncing a word a certain way. It's about communicating your point and getting it across. So as long as you can do that, uh, that, that's the key to confidence, back to that original question. Um, so speaking of questions, we have a lot. Um, I am sure that um, our panelists would love to talk more about them tonight, but uh, there are a few things I wanna get to before we close. So um, uh, before we do that, um, Governor Holden, we see you, thank you for joining us again. Um, any final remarks for tonight's event or for our, our two lovely panelists? Uh, and Governor Holden, you're muted. Am I okay now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, first of all, I it, I thought it was an excellent, excellent program this evening. In fact, don't tell this to anybody else. It's the first time I've listened all the way through any <laughs> webinar that we've done. Uh, <laughs> So thank uh, you. <laughs> that, that's a credit to both of you. Secondly, uh, I would like to be able to put this up and out for people that we're talking to, working with. But I wanted to get your permission uh, to do that because I think uh, you brought this home and down to earth. Uh, you're not talking about pie in the sky or, or anything else. It was very practical. Uh, Betsy and and Linda, both of you, I thought just did an exceptional job. Uh, and this type of information quite candidly is a perfect thing for us to get out there to students in, in the second or third or fourth uh, uh, generation of education, you know, high, uh, college, junior college, whatever, and get, let them listen to this and they would listen to this for an hour they would have a much better idea of how they need to proceed and what they need to do to put their resume together and how they need to interact. I just thought, uh, I just thought it was very well done. It was, Thank you. it was done from a down home basis. These are the real people that I've helped and that's why I wrote it and put their stories in the book. That's exactly right. And I, and I, I thought both of you just did an exceptional job and I, we need to get that information out to, young people in this country wanting to go to another country and other uh, students from other countries or possible employees from other countries coming here. Uh, it, it's not like it's a foreign, foreign environment that they can't be successful in. They just got to understand it and know it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Governor Holden. Um, you know, something we've done in these programs before with some of our more political participants is, is we've said, if you could say in 60 seconds, one thing to the opposing party, what would you want it to be? Or if you could say something to uh, the opposing country in 60 seconds, what would it be? So Linda and, and Betsy, I'm, I'm, maybe we'll start with Linda first. If you could say uh, something about tonight's program in 60 seconds to an international student, what would it be? Yeah, I go back to my um, opening remarks. You will be okay. I did it when unemployment rate is 10% and you can do it, 3.9 unemployment rate. And two is read this book. <laughs> I wish there was this book uh, 20 years ago. And I would say the American economy needs you and Democrats and Republicans do understand that we need the talent that international students bring. Um, and particularly our Asian students are so smart and bring so much knowledge and skill and add so much to our economy and to our communities that you know our country is going to find more ways to attract and keep you here and make you welcome and that you should lean into that and bring, bring you know, bring your best self, be bold and uh, add that value. And, and, you know, we want you here and we need you. Our culture needs it. Very true. Very well said. Um, so with that, I, I think we'll wrap things up. Um, I wanted to go over a few things. Um, Linda, some of your remarks earlier reminded me that uh, we should talk about a few of our programs. One of them is a really, and this message goes to all the, the international students out there and the domestic students. We have a really great program 
at US Heartland China Association called Third Space. Third Space is a digital community and virtual ecosystem for diverse US China intercultural exchange and skill building. So um, essentially, uh, once, once every month, we try to get about 30 American students, 30 international students, usually Chinese, and get them to have a dialogue about um, what, does, uh, what does it mean to be an international student? What does it mean to be a domestic student? How do we work together interculturally to build a better society for everyone? So um, that information is on our website. I will make sure to include that in the follow-up email to everyone, but um, strongly encourage everyone to check that out. Um, again, could not recommend this book more. If you would like to get your own copy, um, please, please, please email me at jconley at usheartlandchina.org. Um, we have a limited number available, but uh, we really wanna get engaged with students more. And uh, again, can't, can't stress how great this book is. Um, so without further ado, uh, that concludes tonight's program. So again, if you have uh, 60 seconds, please stick around and fill out our survey. But um, I just wanna thank Betsy and Linda for joining us. Great program. And uh, we really look forward to all the great momentum that this will bring. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Jason. Thank, thank you, Bob, and everyone who, um, who chose you. to dial in this evening. Well, thank you. Thanks, Betsy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you.